just to give you a brief introduction to who I am, I'm a senior manager here with the organization. I've been with the company for the last 21 years. And previously to that, I spent a bit of time working for the Ministry of Defense, the National Health Service, a little bit of time in industry, and then I decided that uh, it was testing and certification was the route for me. So you also have my contact details on there if you want to come back and contact me at a later date. So just to go through, I just wanted to run through what I'm going to cover, and we'll review this at the end just to make sure that everything has been covered. But today I want to have a look at what is CE marking, a little bit about European directives. I'm going to spend a fair few slides looking at actually responsibilities because they've changed quite recently and it's quite important that everybody understands their place in the supply chain. Um, due diligence, my favourite term of all um, we're going to cover as well. A bit about enforcement, um, how to identify which directives supply. There are 20 plus CE marking directives and sometimes it's not that obvious. And we'll look at a couple of popular ones, the EMC directive and the low voltage directive. Following on from that, we'll have a look at routes to conformity, a little bit about harmonized standards and technical documentation, finally placing products on the market. And then something, you know, I don't know if any of you guys that have joined today um, uh, are involved in fulfillment houses, but I'll also just talk a little bit about those guys because they're becoming a lot more prevalent in uh, our activities. Um, for both for consumer perspective and from our perspective. And then we'll have a look at some questions and answers at the end. So, the million dollar question, what is CE marking? Well, before I answer that for you specifically, we'll just take a little bit of that look at the CE marking itself. That's what it looks like. Um, if you enlarge it, it, the rules and regulations regarding this are fairly straightforward. If you enlarge or reduce it, you must maintain those proportions and you can't reduce it to a vertical dimension less than five millimeters. And that's really all I want to say about the mark itself. So what is it? Well, this is an interesting question for me because we conduct some local research in the UK with UK consumers and we ask the question and the, it's an interesting answer that we get back. We, we, we ask some questions and we say, Who's CE marking for? Who's it aimed at? And invariably people come back and say, well, it's aimed at consumers. Well, it's absolutely nothing to do with consumers at all. Um, and I know, I suspect, I know what some of you may be thinking. You're thinking, well, if I go out and buy something that's got the CE marking on it, it's telling me it's quality and safe, surely. Well, it's not the case, unfortunately. It's actually a mark for customs. It's to promote free movement of goods around the European Union. An um, interesting note, to, to reference here is that some non-EU countries have adopted CE marking procedures as well. It's interesting if we look at what happens in the world, I know I'm going off topic a little bit here, but if we look at what happens in the world, generally the world either looks to what goes on in Europe or what goes on in North America um, to determine what they're going to do. So you find a lot of country approval schemes either are based loosely around CE marking or about what goes on uh, in North America. It places responsibility with the manufacturer or importer, whoever places the equipment on the market, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment, relates to European directives. European directives are marvellous documents for those of you that um, are involved and have read them. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but they're, they're written in real legal terms. So um, I know from my own perspective is I often have to read these things two, three, four times and it's really not clear sometimes what they're getting at, but hopefully we'll cover that and talk a little bit about that as we go on. You'll hear me say this twice throughout the presentation. It's, pri uh, it's primarily self-certification, but it's not evidence of compliance in itself. So C marking, not evidence of compliance in itself. And please hold that thought. So if we just move on. So... To understand this, we really need to have a look at EU directives. And EU directives, they're called new approach directives, but these new approach directives set out what we call essential requirements. So my background is I'm an electrical, I'm an electrical electronics engineer, I've spent most of my time here involved in electrical product safety or product certification. It's the low voltage directive out of all of these that's dear to my heart. So low voltage directive deals with electrical product safety. And the essential requirement of the low voltage directive is products shall not cause injury, harm or damage to people, property or domestic animals. That's what you have to meet. Now, it, the reason I'm, I'm going to some lengths to explain that is because 
I hear a lot of discussions that people say, and they say, well, my product, my, my product, whatever it is, my thing doesn't fall neatly within, you know, I hear debates and arguments. Oh, should it be tested to IEC 6950? Should it be tested to IEC 60065? It doesn't really matter. What you've got to comply with is not standards. Standards are a means to an end. The critical thing is demonstrating compliance with that essential requirement. So the standard, provided it addresses the hazards of your product or potential hazards with your products, doesn't really matter. You've just got to pick a standard that's appropriate um, as a mechanism to apply to comply with the essential requirements. Um, so the harmonized standards then, and I'll explain a bit about harmonized standards as we go on, but they provide the detailed technical information required to meet those essential requirements. And the directives also explain um, how you demonstrate conformity. So what's the conformity assessment process and procedure? And products that meet essential requirements must display CE marking. It's not optional. The reason I say that is because I have some interesting discussions here in my day-to-day -day work here. And I have phone calls from people and they say, Richard, it's okay um, because my customers agreed to accept my product without CE marking. Well, that's not okay. It's not a contractual obligation. It's a legal obligation. So please, you must not fall down that route at all. Um, but equally, I've had other interesting discussions where people say to me, actually, um, we, we, we play it safe, we apply CE marking to all our product ranges. And I was talking to somebody once who said, yeah, we, you know, one of our product lines is pencils, we apply CE marking to pencils. Well, that's just as bad because there's no European directive that covers pencils. So it's just as bad to apply CE marking when you shouldn't than to not apply it at all. Um, and essentially, CE marking means that products can be sold anywhere across the European community, European economic area. So, um, I thought we'd just spend a little bit of time having a look at what directives are out there. So, there's two slides that cover this, and you'll get a flavour for these. So, C marking directives cover ev anything and everything, pretty much. Active implantable medical devices, cableway installations designed for carrying people, eco-design. This is, this is quite a new one. It's spent a lot of time in the press um, recently, particularly with regards to... It got quite a lot of bad press, actually, about the changes to motors and the fact that um, vacuum cleaner manufacturers were up in arms saying I now have to, to reduce the, the power consumption of my motor. Um, but we can talk a little bit about that later. EMC, um, potentially explosive atmospheres, explosives, in vitro diagnostic devices. I'm skipping through these a little bit. Um, machinery, medical devices, personal protective equipment, pyrotechnics, toys, pressure vessels. There's 21 of these things. Um, and you've really got to keep it clear in your mind which apply to you, which don't apply to you. I'll give you some hints and tips a bit later on with regarding to that. Um, now, I'm afraid this is, this, is, there's, there's a, this is a bit of a tedious part of the presentation, I'm afraid, because but I do think it's important that we look at legal responsi or responsibilities of legal operators. Um, there is a new legal framework. Well, not quite so new now, but there is a relatively new legal framework. It defines responsibilities of economic operators who operate in the supply chain. So, you guys. Um, it will be included in revisions to directives as they come along, and it will take a bit of time to be fully implemented, but there's some key changes that are coming along here. So, I, th I think it's a good thing that we go through these and just um, discuss them. So, first off, we look at the first economic operator, the manufacturer. And there's a definition here. It says you are the manufacturer if the product is marketed under your brand, if you have the product made on your behalf, or if you make the product yourself. Critically, that makes you responsible for compliance with all legislation. This is European legislation, bear in mind we're talking about here. Interestingly, you cannot discharge that responsibility. You cannot pass that responsibility up the supply chain. So you can't say my authorised representative or my distributor or the retailer is responsible for that. If you are the manufacturer, you are responsible. And the manufacturer may place directly on the market. And what responsibilities does the manufacturer have? Well, certainly they're responsible for carrying out the conformity assessment processes, to have technical documentation available, to draw up the declaration of conformity. We'll talk about these terms as I go on. Provide instructions and safety information, Satisfy traceability requirements. Keep documentation for at least 10 years. 
Ensure equipment bears type, batch, serial number, product name, company name, trademark, affixed CE marking. If you're wondering where this is going and where this has come from, it's because supply chains have got phenomenally complicated and it's been very difficult for the market surveillance authorities in Europe when they find uh, unsafe products, and we'll talk a bit about unsafe products as we go on, when they find unsafe products, it's been very difficult for them to identify who's operating in the supply chain. And that's where all these new definitions and responsibilities are coming from to tighten up that traceability. So next we look at the authorised representative. Authorised representative established in the European Union explicitly designated by manufacturers to act on their behalf in carrying out certain tasks required in applicable directives. So they can represent manufacturers from inside or outside the EU. The authorised representative, however, must be located within the European Union. And they act on behalf of the manufacturer. They must be formally appointed. There must be a contract um, defining responsibility. So you can't just say, yeah, actually, here's my authorised representative, they act on my behalf. There needs to be some formal agreement in place that says this is what they are doing on behalf of the manufacturer. Um, so it's not importers or distributors unless they are formally appointed, and it's administrative responsibilities only, and they, ca they certainly cannot modify products on their own initiative. They're acting on behalf of the manufacturer. The manufacturer has to be responsible for modifying uh, the product. So this brings us on to importer. Um, I'll just pretty much read this extract as is. Um, when goods are produced um, in countries and the manufacturer is not represented, importers must make sure the products they place on the market comply with applicable requirements and do not present a risk. The importer has to verify that the manufacturer outside of the EU has taken the necessary steps and that documentation is available on request. Interestingly, this is what we've been suggesting to you guys that you need to be doing from the outset. Um, but anyway, now it's, it's documented, it's in the new framework, you have to do this stuff. And they have a key role in guaranteeing compliance. They have to verify the manufacturer has done what they have to do. So the importer confirms the conformity assessment's been carried out. Critically, <laughs> there's two key things here. I know that they're kind of bullet points underneath here, but they're quite critical. They have to refrain from placing product on the market if there is any doubt that the manufacturer hasn't done what they are supposed to have done, and they should take corrective actions if the products are even placed on the market. Um, ensuring the manufacturer has met their obligations, so just to recap here really, conformity assessment and marking, technical documentation, technical file, traceability, safety instruction, safety information. They also must make sure that traceability is maintained. So keep a copy of the Declaration of Conformity for 10 years. Ensure technical documentation is available to be provided to the surveillance authorities. We'll cover this a little bit later on. Um, indicate name and address on the product. Ensure that a contract with the manufacturer is established. A formal agreement is recommended here. Um, almost there, the distributor so the distributor, well, what the, the key bit about the distributor is they must act with due care to ensure their handling does not adversely affect compliance. So be able to identify who supplied the product. They should know that. Demonstrate that due care has been taken. Um, before placing on the product, verify there's required conformity markings accompanied by relevant documents and the importer and traceability obligations are satisfied. Um, identification addresses and traceability, if the manufacturer is within the EU, manufacturer's address has to be on the product. Applies even if actual production occurs outside of the EU. This is where the manufacturer is located though, not necessarily the factory. If the manufacturer is outside the EU, manufacturer's address but now importer's address. Own brand products, importer and distributor address only, but you may say manufactured by, imported by or distributed by. A lot of this, I hope, seems like quite good common sense, but actually it's been a real nightmare up to now to try and work out where this is going. Um, type batch serial number or other identification, for example, the use of stock keeping units. You know, so if it's somebody involved in retail, that's, that's the way they may check this. 
Um, manufacturer importer's name or trademark identifications must allow traceability. And other markings, such as electrical ratings, for example, and warnings, are also required but don't fall under this particular, uh, particular aspect. So as I say, it's really about um, good common sense, but I thought it was important to run through this um, with you guys, so I apologise that went on a little bit. Um, so the next thing is, if we now look at CE marking and how it's enforced, varies from country to country, so I'm really going to talk about how it's enforced in the UK, but what you've got to bear in mind here is there is going to be similar procedures, similar organisations, similar bodies operating across the rest of Europe. So. First off, just before we talk about enforcement specifically, we need to understand the legal status of directives. I've already mentioned directives, these 21 C marking directives. And actually, if you have a look here, I've listed a few of them. There's the ROS directive, the Low Voltage Directive, EMC, RTTE, Eco Design, Energy Labeling, and so on. But in the next column along, I've also listed how they're implemented into UK law, and that's via statutory instruments. So again, low voltage directive dear to my heart, equally dear to my heart is the Electrical Equipment Safety Regulations 1994, statutory instrument 1994-3260, the amount of time that's imprinted in my brain. Um, but that is critical because it's that that if you fall foul of the law, that is what you would be prosecuted against. It's that statutory instrument. It's how it's implemented into national law. So, who enforces the law? Well. You might think at first point, well, this is going to be trading standards, but actually it's not quite as clear-cut as that, and this list is certainly isn't, isn't definitive. It um, really depends on the directive and the nature of the complaint or the investigation. So for if it's machinery or pressure vessels or explosive atmospheres, then it's probably going to be the health and safety executive. If it's consumer products, most likely local trading standards. If it's medical devices, most likely the M MHRA. Um, if it's uh, radio spectrum matters, Ofcom. If it's to do with restriction of hazardous substances, National Measurement Office, National Weights and Measures. So it really varies, but again, I just wanted to explain uh, the whys and hows. And moving on from that, we then need to look at, well, what can the enforcement authority do? Well. You know, it's difficult times at the minute. We've got a lot of austerity in the country. You know, budgets have been cut, but, you know, trading standards have been cut. But nonetheless, this is what these guys can do. They can challenge products that are on the market, pull samples from the market for examination, request technical documentation. Please hold that thought, and I'll come back to that in a second. They certainly enlist third party laboratories to test or check products. We do a lot of that, um, in no part because. You know, I'm talking to you from our location down here just between Portsmouth and Southampton. We've got the Port of Southampton on our doorstep and we spend a lot of time with those guys down there making, you know, having a look at what arrives in Southampton Port. Um, respond to public complaint. RAPEX, I will tell you a little bit about RAPEX in a minute. RAPEX, if you've not come across this before, it will be a real eye-opener for you. And what I'd ask you to or encourage you to do after the webinar is Google RAPEX, R-A-P-E-X, it's the rapid alert system for non-food products in the European community. It's a way of basically notifying all member states about unsafe products that have been found uh, in the various countries. And they can certainly instigate legal proceedings, ban products from sale, product recalls, fines, but imprisonment. And imprisonment, not that I want to panic everybody that's listening to this, but imprisonment, you can't hide behind the company. If, if the person who signs the Declaration of Conformity, and I will cover this in a bit more detail, the person who signs um, the Declaration of Conformity can be personally liable. So just take a moment to think about that. That's big implication. Imprisonment, personal liability. Um, and here's a link to RAPEX. You can have a search on RAPEX as well, but probably the most critical thing or the most interesting thing for you are the next few slides. I've gone onto the RAPEX database today. So these are four extracts that I've listed off, listed off the RAPEX database as of today, 23rd of June. Um, and I just want to talk you through some of these things. So the first thing you see is the country that notified the, the action. So this, in this case, was Bulgaria. It's a toy. It's a toy rattle. Tells you the brand. Tells you the name. Dream makers, mommy love. Um, tells you the type numbers, references, gives you a bit of a description. 
What's the problem with it? Well, choking. The handle of the rattle is too long. If a child puts it in its mouth, it gets stuck and obstructs the airways. Does not comply with the Toy Safety Directive and more specifically the European Standard EN 71 Part 1. What happened? Voluntary recall from the product. Okay, so just be think this is just what I've lifted off today. And RAPEX notifications are published every week. And there's normally around 70, 80 notifications every week. Um, the next one, I was staggered to read this. I mean, I've seen some, I've seen some pretty shonky stuff, I can tell you guys. Um, but I was pretty staggered when I saw this. It's an electric, uh, it's electric radiant heater, it looks like to me. I mean, I can only see the same information that you guys get. Um, there is a directive called REACH. REACH is Restriction, Evaluation and Authorization of Chemicals. This thing contains asbestos fibers. Um, asbestos is an out-and-out -out carcinogen. It's cancer-promoting, cancer-causing. Again, what was the measure? Voluntary withdrawal of product from the market. I've never come across this in my days. Don't I see something that contains asbestos? Um, these are great travel adapters. Um, if you've got one of these things that you can see the picture of, my best advice to you is please get rid of it because we see a lot of the this this particular one or, or very close derivatives. They're killing machines, effectively. Um, the situation is, is these kind of devices here, if you're not familiar with how they work, you, you basically pop out the plug pins for the country, for the, for the type of socket you want to plug into. Difficulty with these things is, is that you can unpop some, one plug pins, plug it in, and touch live plug pins uh, that, are, that, are, that are in the device. Um, it's absolutely astonishing for me. And this is the kind of stuff, bearing in mind, that is on the market. You know, this is the work of the market surveillance authorities. Um, so withdrawal of the product, recall the product from end users. Um, Last one, as I say, take a look at these because I think it will be a real eye-opener for you, but these are soft toys. Um, I don't know if, I'm not a chemist, by the way, but um, so please don't send me any awkward chemistry questions at the end of the, of the webinar, but um, phthalates, for those of you, so this is the stuff like DHP, phthalates, phthalates are nasty stuff, they're used as plasticizers for plastics, makes plastics feel nice, um, but plasticizers are bad, they're linked to, um, you know, and DNA disruptors and birth defect, pretty nasty stuff. Um, this thing contains 21.5% by weight of DHP. Um, DHP, DBP and BBP, all phthalates are prohibited in, toiled and, uh, <laughs> in toys and childcare articles. Pretty astonishing really. But anyway, I, I leave that with you guys, you can take a look for yourselves. Um, and hopefully you found that a bit of an interesting eye-opener. Due diligence, this is my absolute favourite term in the whole world. Um, so anybody that's heard me present other bits and pieces will have heard me ramble on about due diligence before, but it's absolutely critical for you guys. Um, and very simply, what is due diligence? Well, it's knowing what's required. Ignorance is no defence of the law. And I always say to people, you know, look, if you've got a technical file, and your technical file, the... You know, and there's a problem with the product, and the problem ends up in a court of law. God forbid, if the problem, if the product ends up in a court of law, or you end up in a court of law, and and there's an expert witness across the table. And the expert witness says, well, look, you know, your technical file's good, but I think you've applied the wrong standard, or you've not covered something quite right. There's going to be, you know, they're going to take, they're going to work with you. They're going to work with you to resolve it. You know, because you've tried to do the best of your ability, the best of your knowledge, even though you haven't quite got it right. The people that are going to have a real problem are the kind of people that they say, can I see your technical file? And they say, oh yeah, um, yeah, what's that? <laughs> CE marking, I heard about that once, you know, what do I need to do? Um, so it's no defence of the law. Um, so you need to know what's required, demonstrating compliance with directives, declaring you've met requirements, being properly prepared. The um, question I get all the time is, can I buy a book? Is there a good book I can buy that explains about CE marking? There is, but my best advice to you guys is please don't waste your money. Um, if all the information that you need to know is all in the public domain. And it's on websites like ours, our competitors. Um, I know they're, they're, they're BIS, but they'll always be the DTI to me. I'm showing my age. But um, the Department of Trade and Industry or the BIS website, some fantastic good guidance. The European Commission website is very, very good. That's all you need to remember, really. Um, the other thing I'd just say to you guys is, 
look, if you guys aren't sure about something, we're not the kind of organisation here that starts the clock running every time we answer the phone. Give us a call. We'd be more than happy to have a discussion with you about what we think you need to meet, what directives, what standards. You know, tell us where you want to sell the product. We'll tell you what we think you need to do. No charge. You know, so please don't save your money. Don't go and buy a book. Not that I've got anything against the authors of people that write these kind of books, he says hastily. Um, so a bit about applying directives. I wanted to really look at two, two directives that apply to most electrical equipment and products. First off is electromagnetic compatibility, the EMC directive. EMC, fundamentally, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys know all about EMC, but if I go back to my childhood, I used to get quite irritated with my mother when she used to go and dry her hair because she turned her hair dryer on and at that point analog television, the television would all get interference on it and I couldn't watch my favourite programmes. Great example of EMC. That's a silly example. It, it you know, it's just a nuisance and inconvenience for me. But equally, I don't want to walk into Southampton Airport with my mobile phone and find that I wipe out air traffic control. So there's some pretty serious connotations around EMC. But that's fundamentally what it is. It's the ability of electronic equipment to operate together without significant performance degradation or interference to operate all together in their co-located environment. Um, so I'll tell you the scope in a second, but there are some exemptions first off. Doesn't cover, or, or, or one exemption is equipment covered by the scope of the radio and telecommunication terminal equipment. So if you've got intentional transmitters, products got a Bluetooth radio in it, for example, not going to come under the EMC directive as such. Um, aeronautical products as referred to in that regulation, radio equipment used by amateurs, and stuff that's benign. So what I mean by that is if you're making very, very simple non-wireless doorbells, battery, bit of wire, push, push button, it's benign. It's not gonna it's not gonna generate interference. There's no interference that's gonna cause it to fall over. It's benign. Don't need to test it. So if we actually look at the words here, Equipment shall be designed so that electromagnetic disturbance generated does not exceed a level above which radio and telecommunications equipment or other equipment cannot operate as intended, has a level of immunity to expected disturbance in the environment without unacceptable degradation. So what we do here is if we've got a, if you think about a product with an Ethernet port on it, we would put it in our chamber and do immunity testing, and during immunity testing we would plug you know, populate that port, have some Ethernet traffic through that port. It's not about just making sure that the traffic contains, you know, carries on, uh, you know, through the port. It's about defining a performance criteria. It's about saying, well, you know what, my minimum acceptable packet loss is this. My minimum speed, a degradation in speed I can accept is this. It's about making EMC as a performance test at the end of the day. Um, I did say it was a very quick introduction. <laughs> I'll be happy to talk to you guys afterwards or drop me an email or something if you want to go into it more detail. Um, so low voltage directive, well, what's its scope? Well, it applies to electrical equipment. This is the specific wording. It says designed for use with a voltage rating between 50 and 1,000 volts um, AC and 75 and 1,500 volts DC. Actually, it applies to input and output voltages. So not stuff that's generated inside equipment, input or output. And interestingly, that's what it is currently. There is a change coming to the low voltage directive, so you guys should be prepared for this. I've got no date for you yet, but it's pretty certain, not 100%, but pretty certain that the lower voltage limits are going to be removed entirely. This won't be a shock to you if you're involved with RTTE compliance, because RTTE directive for years now has already had this in place. It, it, it abolishes the lower voltage limit. Um, but that's only for the scope of RTTE type products. But it's coming. It's going to open up potentially a whole new load of product types that are going to fall under the scope of the LVD. Again, exceptions. Well, stuff that's for use in explosive atmospheres, equipment for radiology, uh, radiology and medical purposes, for lifts, electricity meters, stuff. Basically, these, these exemptions are there if they're covered by other things, other directives or other legislation, other requirements. So if we look a little bit in detail here, under low voltage directive, products must be marked with rated characteristics, must be clearly marked with brand name or trademark, kind of links into the uh, new legislative framework I was talking about earlier. 
be made in such a way to ensure they can be safely, properly assembled and connected. This is a good one. I, I like telling stories, by the way, but there was a story here um, about a product we got into test here. Had a look at it, and we had to do creepage and clearance measurements when we do electrical safety testing, and it passed. But when we looked at it, the only reason it passed is because it was the creepage and clearance, meeting those creepage and clearance distances was critical depending on um, there, was, there was ring terminals, and if you loosen the ring terminals and move the terminals around slightly, then it no longer met the creepage and clearance distances. So from a type test perspective, it was fine. As we, as we received it, it passed the requirements, but the point we went back to the manufacturer with was, guys, you, you're absolutely reliant on the dexterity of the operator on the production line. If they've had a heavy night or just a bit off or just, you know, and you just slightly rotate that ring terminal, don't put that ring terminal in just the right place. So that's why it talks about being sure they can be safely and properly assembled and connected. Um, that last point on there is really reinforcing the bit I said about the essential requirement, shall not cause injury, harm or damage to people, property or domestic animals. If we move on, um, I'm not going to talk about these in too much detail, but electrical equipment must not endanger domestic animals and property and persons. And the bottom point is quite critical. It also says under foreseeable conditions of overload. I'll give you a great example of foreseeable conditions of overload. I'm sure that everybody has all got mobile phones or some other portable device. Uh, and I'm sure that we've all probably misplaced our charger at some point and then found another charger that we think, ah, oh, that's got the right plug on it. That will charge my device. That will fit. And probably it's okay. But you can't always make that guarantee. That's where if you read instruction manuals, very often the product, the phone, or whatever it is, will say only use the approved accessory because although the plug might fit, the voltage might be too high or the current might not be high enough or a whole other number of things that might then make that new system unsafe. So conditions of overload, foreseeable misuse. Um, okay, so we're, we're kind of getting there. We're making some progress now. So now if we look at harmonized standards. Harmonized standards are your friend in all of this because they give you something called a presumption of conformity. Now bear in mind, when I first started talking and said, look, guys, don't get hung up on whether you've got a 6950 product or a 6065 product. It's broadly irrelevant because you've got to comply with the directive. Um, the reason I say that is because these, if you pick the right standard, you get what they call a presumption of conformity. So, for example, EN 6950 and EN 60065 and EN 62368 and EN 60335 and EN 61010, the whole load of others, are all listed in what we call the Official Journal of the European Union under the Low Voltage Directive. These are really critical because if you comply with those standards, you get an automatic presumption of conformity with the directive, which is the end goal. So European harmonized standards are your friend. Um, so I'll just explain, they, they need to support one or more directives, that's what makes these standards a harmonized standard. They will have been produced by CEN or CENELEC, they must be published in the official journal. Official journal is public domain, just Google EU OJ LVD or EU OJ EMC or EU OJ MDD for medical devices and it will bring up the OJ list. And it needs to have been published by at least one national standards body. But it's your friend, gives you that very vital presumption of conformity. I just put this slide in as a bit of a recap here because we've spoken about a lot of stuff here. Um, so directives state legal objectives, the essential requirements that, you've got to be made, that you have to meet. Harmonized standards specify those technical means to meet those objectives. Um, and harmonized standards are one way to meet the essential requirements, but they're not the only way. It's just you don't have that valuable presumption of conformity. So if I was this way inclined, I could go home this evening, I'd go into my shed, I could make an electrical product, and I could write my rationale as to why it doesn't uh, cause injury, harm, or damage to people, property, or domestic animals. I say I could do that. In reality, even after doing this for 21 years, I'd be a fool to myself to even try. It would take me weeks, probably, Whereas if you test to a European harmonized standard, presumption of conformity, job done. Right. Technical files. I just wanted to talk about technical files a little bit here. Um, 
What are people often? People always say to me, "What is a technical file?" And I, and I can I, on the next few slides, I will share with you the the, the kind of con, typical content of a technical file. But fundamentally, you've got to think, or I say to people, you know that you've got a good technical file if you could give that technical file to somebody else, and they could read it. This other person, this other person could not. They, they would be a relatively competent person, but they don't have to be an engineer, they don't have to be an expert in your type of product, but they should be able to read that document, and at the end of it, they should be able to understand what it is, how it works, how it's made, and how it's compliant. And if you tick those four things, you've got a good technical file. Okay, so I, I perhaps I look at things a bit too simplistically, but fundamentally, that's what it's all about. Um, Officially, technical documentation should be to enable enforcement authorities to assess the conformity of the product through requirements of the directives. That's why I just gave you those four topics. If you, if, if, if you think about from the um, market surveillance guy's perspective, they want to be able to pick something up and read it and understand it, know what the product is, know how it's made, know how it works, know how it's compliant. Must cover design, manufacturing, and operation. I, I often go to companies and they say to me, Oh yeah, we've just designed a new product. Now we're going to make the technical file, and you know the design guys drew straws, and you know Joe over here got the short straw, and he's going to produce the C marking technical file. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't have to be that way. With just a little bit of forethought, a little bit of um, you know due diligence, a little bit of understanding what you need to do, your technical file. Um, you can produce it automatically. Your design file that you have to do for your for your R and D activities when you're doing product development can become your technical file. They don't have to be two different things, um, and it forms the basis for your compliance case. What's it got to contain? I'll go through this quite quickly. But general description of the equipment, conceptual design, descriptions and explanations. Lists of standards applied in full or in part it might well be with standards that there isn't one single standard that covers all the hazards or potential hazards. You might have to apply one standard and bits of another or two standards or three standards. The difficulty with standards is the wheels turn very, very slowly with standards committees um, and technology moves phenomenally quickly. And sometimes a cutting edge product, a product will come along and you think, oh, yeah, actually, mm, that's got some hazard, potential hazards in it that aren't quite addressed by one standard. So you've got to be thinking about that as well. List of components, complete bill of materials, but also critical components. What I mean by critical components is they could be safety critical. The fuse is a safety critical component. Equally, they could be EMC critical. Its EMC performance might be reliant on an EMC filter. That would be an EMC critical component. Results of design calculations, test reports. Test reports, by the way, don't have to, much, much as I'd love to stand here and say to you guys, you have to come to us. Um, test reports, you could, you could quite happily um, do your own testing. It's not a problem. You just need to be able to make sure that you are competent. If you, if you ever end up with a problem, and you produce your technical file and, they, and the expert witness says, oh, I see you've done your own testing, expect to be cross-examined because they're going to be saying to you, right, well, demonstrate you've got the right equipment, demonstrate you're familiar with the standard, demonstrate you know what you're talking about. They won't just accept it at face value. If you go to somebody like us or one of our competitors, you get the advantage that we're accredited, we go through all the processes, we should know what we're doing. Um, so, and a copy of the Declaration of Conformity, of course, absolutely. Okay, so the format of technical files. Um, again, they can be paper, they can be electronic. If they're electronic, please do a trial run. Um, I know from bitter experience, you know, hyperlinks break. You know, you click the button and it says document not found or it's been moved to a different server. If it's electronic, it needs to be backed up. It's got to be easy to produce the documentation on short notice. If I was talking to you guys, I would ask you guys a question. I would say, how long do you think you get from the enforcement authorities to produce your technical file? And if, if I could hear your answers, um, you'd be telling me, oh, I don't know, two weeks, few days, few hours. I'd get a whole range of answers. The answer is, it varies. It varies depending on the severity of what's being investigated. If it's a routine inquiry, you might have two or three weeks. It's not a problem. But if, if there's been an injury, you might have two days. 
you know, 48 hours, and you've got to be pretty certain you can pull that documentation together within that kind of time frame. Um, and please, you can't just forget about it. I, I've been with companies where they 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 take me down to some basement store, and then we find the key, and we find eventually go into a cupboard, and we blow the dust off, and they go, "Hey, here's, your here's our technical file." And I say, "Great. Have you changed the product?" "No, no, not not many changes to it at all." And I say, "Really? What? No cost reductions?" "Ah, yeah, we cost reduced it." But that's got to be documented in your technical file. It needs to live and needs to represent the current build of the product. You can't just do it and forget about it. Declaration of conformity. Um, it's a formal statement. Products comply with applicable directives and standards. You guys produce declaration of conformity. We can't. You guys have to do that. Um, number two, signed by a responsible person within the organisation. People always say to me, who's a responsible person? And I turn the question around and say, will you tell me? Um, and people say, well, we get the MD to, to sign declaration of conformity. And I say, okay, nothing wrong with that. But you've got to think about it in context. If it's if it's a huge if it's a huge company, the MD is certainly at a level senior enough to be able to take that decision. Of course, it, of course they are. Um, but um, are they close enough to the product design to be able to understand what it is they're signing? And I often say to people as well is, look, guys, if I was being I'm on the other side of the fence to you guys, but if I was asked to sign declaration conformity and somebody just gave me a declaration conformity, I'd hand it back to them and say. I'm not signing this. I want to at least see the technical file because the technical file is it supports the declaration of conformity. I wouldn't want to review it in depth. I'd at least want to have a flick through it and make sure it kind of looks okay. It's got the right stuff in it. Um, so what my suggestion to you guys is it should be somebody that's senior enough in the organisation, but maybe not too senior. It needs to be somebody that's close enough to the product development, technical director, R&D director, engineering manager, something like that. It's not evidence of compliance in itself, that's the technical file, I've given that away really in the presentation already, and again it's the minimum legal requirement. Declaration must include name and address of the manufacturer or authorised representative, description, reference to standards, identification of the signatory, last two digits of the year in which CE marking was first affixed. There's no template for this, you can come up with your own template. Alternatively, if you guys want to contact me, I can give you a template, it's not a problem. Um, so finally, after all of that, if I haven't completely turned everybody off with that, um, we now get to placing on the market and putting into service. So, products must comply with applicable C marking directives when placed on the market for the first time put into service. There's some definitions here. Placing on the market is the initial action of making products available for the first time on the community market. Um, interestingly, making available can be for payment or free of charge. Now, we're all in business here, guys, so I'm hoping that all you guys are selling what you make. But um, sometimes, if you think about magazines that might give away a, a free travel hairdryer as a promotional gift, just because you're giving it away doesn't mean that you can forfeit your obligations. You've still got to make sure it complies. And putting into service takes place at the moment of first use within the community. Um, so, Manufacturer must put together technical documentation. Manufacturer or authorised rep must drop the DOC. Manufacturer or authorised rep must affix CE marking. Sounds simple. Finally, I just wanted to have a quick chat with you about fulfilment houses. I'm sure that most of you guys, if, if you're not involved with it, have probably purchased stuff from a fulfilment house, knowingly or unknowingly. Um, they are freight forwarding businesses, effectively. So they receive goods from a vendor, they store it for the vendor, they await dispatch details from the vendor, and they dispatch the goods to the consumer. They do not examine goods or documentation. Now, um, if there's, I don't know if anybody from Trading Standards or Enforcement Authorities are online here, but if they are, I'm sure their ears have pricked up at this point and they're thinking, oh, fulfillment houses. Um, fulfillment houses for a long time said, hey, we just take brown package, you know, packages, brown paper envelopes, what, what's in them is nothing, you know, poof, not, not our business. You can't do that if you're a fulfillment house. You, you are obliged to ensure product compliance. Um, and just if you're thinking, well, what are these fulfillment houses and how do they operate? We've got a huge fulfillment house just down the road in Portsmouth. And actually, the, the kind of model that might be is if there is an eBay seller that's based in uh, China, for example, 
they might use the services of a, of a fulfillment house. So you would place your order and send your money to the seller in China, but actually it would be the fulfillment house in Portsmouth, potentially, that might actually then receive the instruction from the seller to put the address label on the, on the package and send it to you. That's really what a fulfillment house is. I just really wanted to, um, to fill you guys in on that front as well.